Hey guys, welcome to the Daily Word Bible Study, a plain and simple book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse study through the entire Bible. Currently we are in uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. Now this is an interesting chapter here because what God is proclaiming is how to be saved, righteousness by the law, according to the law, and what is the lesson here is why sinful man is incapable of achieving this. And yes, this is coming off unfair because basically so far what God is saying, you know, he starts off by saying to, to Ezekiel, he says, look, first he says, Ezekiel, you need to warn the wicked, right? He said, yeah. Uh, um, if, if, if you as a watchman don't warn the people, and notice this, he said, they're going to die in their sin, but I'm going to hold you responsible. He said, now, nah, but if you do warn them and they don't turn from their sin, then they're, they're going to die in their sin, but at least you have saved your soul. In other words, he's going to hold Ezekiel as the prophet, as the leader responsible. Now, then he moves on and says to about what, a righteous person, how under the law, righteousness is established. In other words, you have to continue in all things of the law. Let me bring up my scripture here because I want to read something back in Galatians that Paul taught. And that is in chap Galatians chapter 3, verse 10 says, For all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse because it is written, everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law is cursed. In other words, you have to continue doing all things. Now, remember he said last time, let's go back, we're going to get to Ezekiel now. And so in Ezekiel, when he says, um, if the righteous man lives, he does all of his righteousness, he's doing great, he's keeping the commandments, he's obeying the law, and he gets to the end and he sins, he says, not only will he die in his sin, but watch this, but all of the righteousness that he did won't even be remembered. In other words, it won't count. In other words, God doesn't grade on the curve. In other words, he's not, he won't be able to say, yeah, but I just messed up this one time. I, I just, you know, I, I blew it, but look at all of the righteousness. In other words, I kept 99% of the law. Doesn't that count for it? He says, no. None of that will matter. The day he sins, he's done. Now, that that the, the reason for that. And it's important to understand under the law. See, under the law. And the reason why that's important because even today there are so many Christians. Most denominations teach a work salvation. In other words, you must do something in order to keep your salvation. Now I'm going to do something a little different here. I'm going to veer off because I, I don't want us to be left with just this message since we are going through. However, let me go to show you even in Galatians chapter 3. Let me go back and I want to read this so that we can understand um, um, hear what Paul is saying. Um, so look at verse 14. He says, so when I tell a wicked person, you will surely die, but he repents of his sin and does what is just and right. All right. Um, he says he returns uh, collateral, makes restitution for what he has stolen. 
um, and walks in the statue of life without practicing unity, he will certainly live, he will not die. And then it says, none of the sins he committed will be held against him. I mean, none of the sins he's committed will, will be held against him. He has done what is just and right. He will certainly live. Now, you want to go back. All right. And just so that I'm going to read verse 17, he says, but your people will say the Lord's way isn't fair, even though it is their own way that it's not fair. But let's go back. So again, all of this is, again, according to the law. And the law was never given, okay, that the law was never given that would give life. Let me go back to verse 10. I'm kind of doing things kind of backwards here. So, all right. So look at verse 10. It says, for all who rely on the works of the law are under the curse of the law because it's written. Everyone who does not continue doing everything written in the book of the law is cursed. So it's important to understand, and as I said, so many churches, even today, by the way, this is a New Testament issue that Paul was dealing with here. And even to this day, 2,000 years later, most denominations, the Catholic Church, Protestant denominations, most people wrestle with this issue of living right, doing good deeds, um, that they're not truly saved. But I want to read this, like I said, because I don't want us to get too far out. I mean, I'm a, I mean, that's a heavy statement right here. And unfortunately, and I said most denominations, most Christians gravitate towards what Ezekiel was being warned against as opposed to what the New Testament says. So he says right here, for all who rely on the works of the law under the curse, but it's written, everyone who does not continue doing everything in other words, you have to continue doing everything uh, that is written in the book of the law. It's cursed. Now, it is clear that no one is justified before God by the law. Now, there are two reasons why you can never be justified by the law. One is because you're incapable of keeping everything. Notice he said you must continue to do everything. It is impossible. And then think about this. Uh, God sets up your failure. God sets up man's failure by saying you could almost do everything right, right? In other words, you could do 99% of it and just fail in one point. And then he says, none of the righteousness that you did will count. None of the righteousness that you have accumulated will count. It won't be remembered. So in other words, if you live all of your life, and you come to the last portion of your life, right? So you did all your life, so the last day, all of the righteousness that you've done, you've done all the good things, and you sin in one point, and you sin in one point, then none of that, let's say you live 100 years old, okay? Let's say you live 100 years. You live 100 years, and all of the righteousness that you've done, you live 100 years, and all of the righteousness that you have you have accumulated, all of the righteousness that you've done. So you live 90, let's say you come to the 99 years, okay? And of 99 years, you've kept all the law. So you've accumulated all this righteousness. You're able to say, man, for 99 years, I have done all of this law. But then in that 90, that, that, that 100th year, you sin. And then you die in that sin. He says, those 99 years that you've done all of that good won't even be remembered. You're going to die in your sins. You're going to die in your sin. You go, oh, that's not fair. First of all, when you say it's not fair, it's not fair according to who. You have to look at how God sets up his righteousness. So that's the first thing right here. Now watch what he says right here because I think it's going to clarify it here also give us hope because you might say man who then can be saved well according to the law no one can be saved because no one is in, is capable of keeping everything continuing to doing everything because remember as we saw in Ezekiel if you 
go 99% and that last percent sin, the 99 is not, won't even be remembered. You're going to die in your sin. So why is that? So he says right here, it is clear, verse 11, that no one is justified. And the word justified is to be made right. No one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. That's the saving grace. Literally and figuratively, the saving grace. He said, but the law is not based on faith. It's based upon works. He says, instead, the one who does these things will live by them. And then he says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us because it is written. Curse it is, is cur uh, because it is written, everyone who is hung on the tree is cursed. He said that the purpose, the purpose was that the blessings of Abraham will come on the Gentiles by Christ Jesus so that we would receive the promise through the Spirit, through faith. Okay? Now, um, let me skip down to verse 19. Why then was the law given? And this is kind of an important point. Why then was the law given? It was added because of transgressions. See, it was added because of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. So that's why the law was given. It was added because it was, it was added. Then he says, the law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. Um, now, a mediator is not just for one person, but God is one. Is the law, therefore, contrary to God's promise? Absolutely not. And here's why. Here's why. For if a law had been given that was able to give life, then righteousness would certainly be by the law. But the scripture has imprisoned everything under sin's power so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Before this faith came, we were confined under the law in prison until the coming faith was revealed. The law then was our guardian unto Christ, until Christ. So notice this, the law was the guardian until Christ. You keep notice that throughout this chapter, you keep saying until Christ, so that we could be justified, remember, made right by faith. But since faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian, for you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So let me show you one more verse of scripture before we go back. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Now, remember he said, if there was a law that could be given, that could have given life, righteousness would have come through the law. There were two reasons why the law could not save. Two reasons why you cannot be saved by the law. One, you're incapable of continually keeping the law. And that two, you don't have life. Look at verse 24. I assure you, anyone who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment. Right? Will not come under judgment. Remember, under the law, you always face judgment. Why? Two reasons. You don't have life. And then two, the second, you're incapable of continually keep con con continually doing all things in the law. So one, he says, you will not come into judgment. He says, but has passed from 
death into life. So this is what the law could not do, right? Because it was weak through the flesh, as Paul says in Romans chapter 7, well, I mean chapter 6. Actually, read chapter 7, chapter 6 and 7. So yes, when he says right here that our transgressions, you go back, um, um, where am I at here? Uh, verse 13, when I tell the righteous person that he will surely live, but he trusts in his righteousness and commits iniquity. So remember, if you're trusting in iniquity, he says, then um, none of his righteousness will be remembered. I, I want that to sink in because that means you you don't earn points under the law. So under doing works, good deeds, the law represents the law represents every moral code, everything that is good, doing good, good deeds, right? So when you when you when we go back and we read the law. The law itself is really based upon two commandments. One, it is based upon our love and then devotion to God. And then because of that love and devotion to God, the second commandment is loving our neighbors ourselves. So we love God, we, we surrender to God, and then we... Um, um, as we surrender to God, uh, then we love one another. We value one another. Okay. Um, so that 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 man is incapable of doing that. However, he says right here, if you trust in that righteousness, right, which you cannot do, is I tell the righteous person that he will surely live, but he trusts in his righteousness, committing iniquity, then none of his righteousness would be remembered. And then he will die because of the iniquity that he has committed. Then he says, so tell the wicked person you will surely die. But if he repents from his sin, he says, and does what is just and right. And then he goes on and tells us all of some of the good stuff, right? Some of the good things that he should do. He returns collateral, makes restitution for what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without practicing iniquity. He will certainly live. He will not die. He says, none of the sins he's committed will be held against him. He has done what is just and right. He will certainly live. However, he cannot. He cannot. He cannot live. He cannot. Uh, um, man is incapable of doing this. This is such a revelation, you know, because, again, if you have, put it like this, uh, there is the what's called the once saved, always saved debate. Those who oppose the once saved, always saved, always rely on men doing works. Men doing good works, doing good deeds. Okay? In other words, I believe that once you're saved, you're always saved. Why? Because I believe that Jesus is our propitiation. Let me uh, quickly show you this verse. I'm going to go to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. And uh, look at this. 1 John chapter 2. He says, My little children, I'm writing to you these things so that you may not sin. Right? So you don't sin. Now, we told it. We were told in the New Testament, right? Don't sin. He says, but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, that, that is liberating. Because we fail. We fail. Okay? 
because we're incapable of committing sins. One, and we don't have, we don't have the, we don't have, we don't have the, we're incapable of being the propitiation for our own sins. But Jesus Himself is the propitiation for our sins, and that's great news. Okay, we're gonna obviously continue this in our next study. Don't forget to like and share this video and subscribe to VP the Bible Perspective. And as always, if you have a thought or comment, add it to the comment section below. All comments are welcome. I'll see you in the next study.